Hello, welcome friends. My name is Tanvir Atsi. We'll talk about feminism and feministic art. Feminism is a range of movements and ideologies that share a common goal. That is, to define, establish and achieve equal political, economic, cultural, personal as well as social rights for women. This includes seeking to establish equal opportunities for women in education and employment. A feminist advocates or supports the rights and equality of women. Feminist campaigns are generally considered to be one of the main forces behind major historical societal changes for women rights, particularly in the West, where they are near universally credited with having achieved women's suffrage, gender neutrality in English, reproductive rights for women, including access to contraceptives and abortion, and the right to enter into the contracts and own property. Although feminist advocacy is and has been mainly focused on women's rights, some feminists, including bell hooks, argue for the inclusion of men's liberation within its aims because, according to them, men are also harmed by traditional gender roles. Feminist theory, which emerged from feminist movements, aims to understand the nature of gender inequality by examining women's societal roles and lived experiences. It has developed theories in a variety of disciplines in order to respond to issues such as the social construction of gender. Art criticism and art history rather physical practice of art from a feminist point of view are recent phenomena emerging only during the last 40 years or so. It is significant to understand the beginning of feminist discourse in art history because feminist art begins and continues with theory. It takes a lot from the feminist thinkers and writers and also makes use of text as a base to expression and understanding. Feminism is majorly an ideological approach to a social problem which was taken up through the medium of art. We shall thus begin our understanding of feminism through the theories and critiques of feminism that triggered art practices and ideas. Feminist inquiry in art history began in 1971 with the infamous Linda Nochlin's essay, Why Are There No Great Women Artists? In answer to this question, she stressed that, and I quote, art is not a free autonomous activity of super endowed individual influenced by previous artists and more vaguely and superficially by social forces but rather occurs in social situation is an integral element of social structure and is mediated and determined by specific and definable social institutions be they art academies systems of patronage, mythologies of divine creator and artist as he-man or social outcast." Unquote. The potentially radical implication of Nochlin's initial analysis could not be fully explored until neglected women artists were identified. That was the main objective of a series of biographical and expository studies by Elinir Tuss, Hugo Munsterberg, and Karen Peterson and J.J. Wilson. Nochlin and Sutherland Harris published Women Artists 1550 to 1950. The catalog of momentous exhibition they had organized, which opened in Los Angeles and traveled to Austin, Petersburg, and Brooklyn, brought to the public attention the achievements of women artists in the history of art. In the preface of their catalogue, Harris and Nochlin stated, and I quote, Neither of us believes that this catalogue is the last word on the subject. On the contrary, we both look forward to reading the many articles, monographs and critical responses that we hope this exhibition will generate. Unquote. Their wish was not entirely fulfilled 
for monographs on women artists are still very few and most of them are devoted to artists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Many of those books share to a certain extent the unspoken but still apparent objectives to prove that women have been as accomplished, even if not as great as men, and try to place women artists within the traditional art historical framework. The debate over greatness exemplifies the nature of the issues raised among the first generation of feminist writers. By emphasizing the primary role of institutional factors in determining artistic achievement, Nochlin challenged the myth of the great artist as one who is endowed with that mysterious and ineffable quality called genius. Ten years after Nochlin's first article, two British art historians, Rosika Parkar and Grisinda Pollock, an old mistresses, women art and ideology, took fundamentally new directions from earlier surveys by rejecting evaluative criticism altogether. They turned to an analysis of women's historical as well as ideological positions in relation to art, its production and artistic ideology as means to question the assumptions that underlie the traditional historical frameworks. In doing so, they touched upon another of Nochlin's major points, that is, to what extent our very consciousness of how things are in the world has been conditioned too often falsified by the way most important questions are posed. Parker and Pollock posed new questions further to Nochlin's dialogue like, why has it been necessary to negate so large a part of the history of art, to dismiss so many artists, to denigrate so many works of art simply because the artists were women? What does this reveal about the structures and ideologies of art history? How it defined what is and what is not art? To whom it accords the status of artist and what that status means? Using various new approaches such as the construction of gender and psychoanalytic theory, Pollock and Parker deconstructed the image of women artists and the nature of male fascination with the female body. Let's now turn to a few important concepts that feminist artists work on. Important of these are male gaze, fetish and social order. Now let's explain what these concepts mean and when artists deal with them, how do they execute these ideas through their art. The first is the male case. It's a concept coined by feminist film critic Laura Malvi. It refers to the way visual artists are structured around a masculine viewer, that is the male. Since the beginning of feminist art, theorists and artists have tried to argue about how the female are looked upon and represented in the works of art since antiquity through male case and not as simply as individuals. The females are looked upon as objects of decoration of something to be viewed and not as living species. The women artists thus have tried to break away from the male gaze in their works by representing women as simple human beings doing common activities rather than celebrated beauties in posed compositions. Now coming to fetish, sexual fetishism or erotic fetishism. Sexual fetish or erotic fetishism is a sexual focus on a non-living object or non-genital body part. The object of interest is called the fetish. The person who has a fetish for that object is a fetishist. A sexual fetish may be regarded as a non-object pathological aid to sexual excitement or as a mental disorder if it causes significant psychosocial distress for the person or has detrimental effects 
on important areas of their life. Feminists discuss about man's fetish toward the female body and again the objectification rather than emotional attachment to her as a person. Now the third concept is the social order. The concept came from the psychoanalyst Jack Lacan's concept that woman does not exist, which means that females do not have their existence directly in the social order, but exist according to the social norms of what a woman should be. Lacan put up an important idea that we know about the world because of language. We learn the language, the rules and morals through written or spoken word and thus have a very superficial idea of society. Many women artists thus begin making use of language itself to deconstruct or subvert the meaning of prescribed concepts and create a space for females as individuals. Coming to the feminist art in the light of above concepts, feminism thus can be said to be based majorly on theory and writing, art being derivative. The works of art thus produced are not formalistic or conceptually driven, but rather issue-based. The feminist movement in the art began in the late 1960s. Under the impetus of the more general feminist movement and political activism of the mid-1960s. From the beginning, the emphasis of artists on the East and the West coast was different. New York artists sought economic parity and equal representation in exhibitions through a critique of institutional sexism, whereas their West Coast counterparts were more concerned with exploring issues of aesthetic and female consciousness. The first women's art organization called Women's Artists in Revolution began in New York in 1969 as a supplanter group of the Art Workers Coalition, which was politically radical but indifferent to women's issues. The following year, the Ad Hoc Committee of Women Artists was organized by Lucy Lippard, the art historian critic, to protest the almost exclusion of women artists from galleries and museum exhibitions. The protest against the number of artists in the Whitney Museum of American Arts annual raised the Whitney's consciousness so that instead of the usual 5 to 10 percent representation in 1970, it showed 22 percent women artists. This figure remains almost same even today despite continuous feminist activity. Women in the Arts, another group was founded in 1971 and two years later it organized a major show of 109 contemporary women artists titled as Women Choose Women at New York Cultural Center. It was the first of many such shows that culminated in the exhibition Women Artists 1550 to 1950 organized by Harris and Knockler. Meanwhile, other organizations were created to meet the needs of the proliferation of art by women and the interest in women's art. In New York, the Women's Inter-Art Center opened, including the AIR Gallery in 1972 and Soho 20M in 1973, both of which are still active. In Chicago, Artemisia and Arc Galleries were opened in 1973. Faith Gold and her daughter, Michelle Wallace, organized women students and artists for black art liberation to protest the exclusion of women artists from exhibition of black artists in 1971. Black women artists formed their own organization titled as Where We At. On the West Coast, Judy Chicago organized the feminist art program in 1970 at Fresno State College. The following year, she collaborated with Miriam, with Miriam Shapiro in the feminist art program at the California Institute of Arts. The result was the celebrated Woman House exhibition in which the group took over an entire house to express their particular definition of women's lives. 
Now let's turn to artists and artist groups. In the light of these theoretical considerations and ideations, let's now turn our attention to some of the prominent feminist artists and groups that were active and are still active in the field of visual arts. Mary Kelly, who was born in 1941, is an American conceptual artist, feminist, educator and writer. Kelly has contributed extensively to the discourse of feminism and postmodernism through her large-scale narrative installations and theoretical writings. Kelly's work mediates between conceptual art and the more intimate interests of artists of the 1980s. Her work has been exhibited internationally and she is considered among the most influential contemporary artists working today. Mary Kelly is a professor of art at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she is head of the interdisciplinary studio, an area she initiated for artists engaged in site-specific, collective and project-based work. Kelly is known for her project-based work in the form of large-scale narrative installations. Postpartum Document 1973 to 1979 is a process-based work which uses objects of both personal and theoretical significance to document the mother-child relationship. This is her initial and pioneering work of feminist art where Kelly has used the different objects of her association of pregnancy and child from the days of foetus to the child of its age of four. What is interesting about the work is that she has not used the photographs of the child but objects like his feeding chart, used diapers, clothes, first step after he began walking, scribbles on paper and so on. In her monumental work, Interim, executed between 1984 to 89, Kelly deals with collective memories of women. Its object is to specify the discourse that defines and regulates feminine identities. In the ballad of Castrio Res Hippie, 2001, panels of lint formed in a domestic dryer are joined together to form undulating waves that tell the story of a child abandoned during the war in Kosovo. An Armandieta who was born on 18th November 1948 and died on September 8, 1985, was a Cuban-American performance artist, sculptor, painter and video artist who is best known for her earth body artwork. Born in Havana, Mendieta arrived in the born in Havana, Mendieta arrived in the United States as a refugee in 1961, two years after Marxist revolutionary leader Fidel Castro overthrew the authoritarian government of Cuban President Fugincio Batista. Mendieta's work was generally autobiographical and focused on themes including feminism, violence, life, death, place and belonging. Her works are generally associated with the four basic elements of nature. Mendieta often focused on a spiritual and physical connection with the earth. During her lifetime, Mendieta produced over 200 works of art using earth as a sculptural medium. The Silueta series in 1973 to 1980 involved Mendieta creating female silhouettes in nature, in mud, sand and grass. With natural materials ranging from leaves and twigs to blood and making body prints or painting her outline or silhouette on a wall. In a 1981 artist statement, Mendieta says, and I quote, I have been carrying out a dialogue between the landscape and the female body based on my own silhouette. I believe this has been a direct result of my having been torn from my motherland, Cuba, during my adolescence. I am overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast 
from the womb nature my art is the way i reestablish the bonds that unite me to the universe it is a return to the material source uncut in 1978 mendieta joined the artist in residence inc air gallery in new york which was the first gallery for women to be established in the united states the venture allowed for the opportunity of mendieta to network with other women artists at the forefront of the era's feminist movement during this time mendieta was also actively involved in the administration and maintenance of air in an unpublished statement mendieta noted that and i quote it is crucial for me to be a part of all my artworks as a result of my participation my vision becomes a reality and part of my experience unquote it was during her time at the gallery that she met her future husband carl andre the minimalist her resignation in 1982 is attributed to a dialogue instigated by andre over a collaborative art piece the couple had submitted Nasilueta series in this series Mendieta has tried to express her trauma of death of her classmate who was raped and body disposed of in the jungle she posed herself in different parts and situations of the unknown territories to feel and experience the pain the body of the girl might have gone through another artist judy chicago born as judith silvia pohin on july 20 1939 in chicago is an american feminist artist art educator and writer known for her large collaborative installation pieces which which examine the role of women in history and culture born at chicago as judith cohen she changed her name after the death of her father and her first husband choosing to disconnect from the idea of male dominated naming conventions by the 1970s chicago had coined the term feminist art and had founded the first feminist art program in the united states chicago's work incorporates stereotypical women artistic skills such as needlework counterbalanced with stereotypical male skills such as welding and pyrotechnics Chicago's masterpiece is the dinner party which is in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum The Womb House was a project that involved Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro It began it began in the fall of 1971 They wanted to start the year with a large scale collaborative project that involved women artists who spent much of their time talking about their problems as women they used those problems as fuel and dealt with them while working on the project judy thought that female students often approach art making with an unwillingness to push their limits due to their lack of familiarity with tools and processes and an inability to see themselves as working people she says and i quote the aim of the feminist art program is to help restructure their personalities to be more consistent with their desires to be artists and to help them build their art making out of their experience as women in 1975 chicago's first book through the flower was published it chronicled her struggles to find her own identity as a woman artist now turning to one of the monumental works of 20th century feminist art is her the dinner party chicago decided to take learners lesson to heart and took action to teach women about their history this action would become chicago's masterpiece now in the collection of brooklyn museum first chicago conceived the project in her santa monica studio a large triangle which measures 
8 feet by 43 feet by 30 60 feet consisting of 39 place settings each setting commemorates a historical or mythical female figure such as artists goddesses activists and martyrs the project came into fruition with the assistance of over 400 people mainly women who volunteered to assist in needlework creating sculptures and other aspects of the process is another pioneering feminist artist of the 20th century is american pop artist barbara kruger who was born in new york in 1945 and left there in 1964 to attend syracuse university early on she developed an interest in graphic design poetry writing and attended poetry readings Kruger's earliest works date to 1969 large woven wall hangings of yarn beds sequins feathers and ribbons recuperation they exemplify the feminist recuperation of craft during this period. Despite her inclusion in the White Knee Biennial in 1973 and solo exhibitions at Artist Space at and Fish Bash Gallery, both in New York, the following two years she was dissatisfied with her output and its detachment from her growing social and political concerns. In the fall of 1976, Kruger abandoned art making and moved to Berkeley. California, where she taught at the University of California for four years and steeped herself in the writings of Walter Benjamin and Lola Barthes. She took up photography in 1977, producing a series of black and white details of architectural exteriors paired with her own textual ruminations on the lives of those lived inside. 1979 foreshadows the Isth, mm, published as an artist's book in 1979, it foreshadows the aesthetic vocabulary Kruger developed in her mature work. Kruger stopped taking photographs and began to employ found images in her art, mostly from mid-century American print media sources with words collaged directly over them. Her untitled piece in 1980 commonly known as perfect portrays the torso of a woman hands clasped in prayer evoking the version mary the embodiment of submissive femininity the word perfect is emblazoned along the lower edge of the image these early collages in which kruger deployed techniques she had perfected as a graphic designer inaugurated the artist's ongoing political social and especially feminist provocations and commentaries on religion sex racial and gender stereotypes consumerism corporate greed and power kruger's works are feminist especially in her initial stages of career where she uses language to itself to distort the ideas created by words now let's turn our attention to gorilla girls they are an anonymous group of feminist female artists devoted to fighting sexism and racism within the art world. The group formed in New York in 1985 with the mission of bringing gender and racial inequality within the fine arts into focus within the greater community. Members are known for the gorilla masks they wear to remain anonymous. They wear the masks to conceal their identity because they believed that their identity is not what matters as ggi explains in an interview and i quote mainly we wanted the focus to be on the issues not on our personalities or our own work also their identity is hidden to protect themselves from the backlash of prominent individuals within the art community gorilla girls were formed by seven women artists in the spring of 1985 in response to the Museum of Modern Arts exhibition titled which opened in 1984. The exhibition was inaugural show in the MoMA's newly renovated and expanded building and was planned to be a survey of the most important contemporary art and artists in the world. 
In total, the show featured works of 169 artists, of whom only 13 were female. Guerrilla Girls claimed that a comment by the show's curator further highlighted the, gener further highlighted the gendered bias of the exhibition and of MoMA as an institution. The curator gave interviews saying that any artist who wasn't in the show should rethink his career. In reaction to the exhibition and the prejudice, Matt Shine displayed and decided to protest in front of the museum. Thus, the Gorilla Girls were born. The po protest yielded little success. Gorilla Girls embarked upon a postering campaign throughout New York City, particularly in the Soho and East Village neighborhoods. Once better established, the group also started taking note of racism within the art world, incorporating artists of color into their fold. They also began working on projects outside of New York, commenting on sexism and racism nationally and internationally. Though the art world has remained the group's main focus, challenging sexism and racism in films, mass and popular culture, the politics has also been a part of Gorilla Girls' agenda. Tokenism also represents a major group concern. When asked about the mask, the girls answered, was. When asked about the mask, the girls answered, and I quote, we were gorillas before we were gorillas. From the beginning, the press wanted publicity photos. We needed a disguise. No one remembers for sure how we got out fur. When asked about the mask, the gorilla, the girl, when asked about the masks, the girls answered, and I quote, we were gorillas before we were gorillas. From the beginning, the press wanted publicity photos. We needed a disguise. No one remembers for sure how we got our fun. But one story is that at an early meeting, an original girl, a bad speller, wrote gorilla instead of Kerala. It was an enlightening mistake. It gave us our mask. It was an enlightening mistake. In some mission, the feminist art of 20th century focused on the discrimination that women artists were subjected to in the history of art. Thank you.